Hi, it's Norma from the Hanover Public Library with another book talk from my living room. I'm really happy to be able to get out into my garden again. There's nothing better for my state of mind than to get my hands into the sun warm dirt and plant seeds or pull weeds. I think of gardening as such a hopeful activity. You're creating something for the future, good homegrown food or stunning beauty. But gardens can also be about the past like the one in Canadian author Helen Humphrey's evocative novel, The Lost Garden. In 1941, a horticulturalist named Gwen Davis leaves her beloved London, currently being bombed by the Nazis, for an estate in Devon that has been taken over for growing food. Gwen is put in charge of a group of land girls, young women who work during the war producing food for England. This is a very uh, important job because the Nazis were blocking food imports to Great Britain and rationing was just another hardship people had to endure. The men were enlisted in the armed forces, so women worked in many non-traditional jobs, including farming. Gwen struggles to motivate her young workers. They don't like her, and she's not terribly keen on them either. She gives them nicknames in her mind, according to the type of potato that they remind her of. Gwen is not a natural leader, and the girls resist her at every opportunity, but then fate hands Gwen some very effective leverage when a Canadian battalion is billeted nearby. Although Gwen is uneasy at the prospect of the women fraternizing with the soldiers, she quickly realizes she can use the situation as enticement to get some work out of her crew. But then she finds the lost garden actually three linked gardens, they're hidden away by hedges and clearly haven't been visited for many years. Each garden has a name, a word on a stone, longing, loss, faith. Gwen finds a spiritual home there and is consumed by a desire to understand the creator or creators of this lost garden. Gwen tends it in secret bringing it back, if not to order, at least to being cared for. She's unwilling to share it with anyone, not even the other women with whom bonds of respect and even friendship have begun to form. The only other person she would care to have there with her is the sorrowful, poetry-loving Canadian captain, a man with whom she shares a bit of her own longing and hope. It is in the descriptions of Gwen's garden that Helen Humphreys' true gifts as a writer are most wonderfully displayed. You see, Humphreys is a poet as well as a novelist, so her descriptions uh, of the garden use language, imagery, and metaphor so skillfully that it leaves you breathless. Let me read you just a small sample so you get the idea. The Garden of Loss blooms in May. It is a simpler construction than the Garden of Longing, it contains fewer species, but more plants. The middle of the three gardens, it begins with a great breaking wave of peonies. The blooms are white and pale pink, grow upright for now, giant buttons of brilliance festooning green leafy tunics. But soon their heads will become too heavy for the thin weed-like stalks on which they rise with such hope. And the peonies will crash to the ground in a wave of grief. They are too much for themselves and soon they know it. I've always loved peonies. There is something almost heroic in their reckless collapse, and there is nothing sadder than a crowd of stricken peonies, their heads full of rain. The more time I spend studying and tending this garden, the more respect I have for whoever planted it. What they knew of longing was that it sprang from the earth at odd moments, unplanned and unexpected, born on different carriers, but loss was more uniform than that. It surged up and carried one along. Loss was a choir. Loss moved in harmony. It struggled heavenwards. It crashed to earth. So. All of Helen Humphrey's books are like this. They're perfect little jewels of stories that are absolutely unforgettable. Her books are available on Libby and Overdrive. So, so stay calm and carry on reading, and I hope to see you soon at the library.